they made it definitely seem like there was some debauchery going on on these tours. And they said, you had a gang of groupies. You know, and then I remember one time, my uh, financial advisor at the time, she was like, hey, did you know you're spending more than you're making like every month? And I was like, oh, for real? Went through it, he's talking about Christ. And I'm just like remembering things I heard of as a youth, like at that Christian school. Wow. And then um, a lot of those timelines were a little bit off. The story doesn't get fully told. So it gets told in a way that's not fully accurate. Like they said, uh, Bruce Lawn. Professor Grayson, Professor Live, live in the studio audience. You are our uh, third in-person guest. Honored. Honored, man. Thank you for being here, bro. Thanks for having me. Before we get into all that stuff, I, I do have to say that I feel like you're one of those guys that uh, has believed in me pretty early. And uh, sometimes we take that stuff for granted, or sometimes you may not know the impact your words have. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, even, like, you coming over here, and I'm like, hey, man, just know, like, studio's a little snug. Mm. You know, he's like, your globe's gonna be crazy. You're like, your globe's gonna be crazy when you're two million. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I'm just kind of like, yeah. man, I'm just aspiring for one million, and you see the two million. Yeah. But you're, but you're, uh, you're comfortable enough to speak that and say that and encourage me. I don't know. I'm assuming you're this way with everybody. Yeah, and we need that. And I saw, and I recognize your talent, to be honest. I mean... I'm always intentional about trying to help everybody, especially in this social space, because everybody looks to me for like, how do I go viral? How do I build my YouTube? You yeah. know? But like, you knew a lot out the gates. Like, you're well studied, you know? And you were like versed in um, streaming and stuff through doing it through ministry, I knew. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I just saw the talent and like how you're doing it and like your hustle and consistency. And yeah. I was like, this is special. So I am saying it in being intentional to build you up, but also like, it's, you know, I recognize the you know, where it's going. I'm like, okay, let's yeah. go. Well, I appreciate it, man. It, it means a lot to have uh, you, a, a bigger creator, but you as a, you know, as a streetball legend, uh, to, to see that, to say that, to be comfortable saying that. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Of course. In person. Thanks for having Amazing. me. Amazing. You, you, you've, you've been here in person before. It was a little different. Yeah. And uh, when we upgraded we, now. Yeah, we upgraded a bit. Um, dude, I, I want to go, I want to talk about a lot of things. Okay. The, obviously the Netflix documentary, which is nuts. I want to hear more about your faith. Okay. The new the brand is going crazy, but I, I want to go to the beginning because mm. I don't know how many people know your origin story, mm. right? Like white kid, similar to my story, yeah. playing street ball, and then you you become this elite level athlete. Um, you're from Oregon, yeah, I'm from a small town, Kaiser, Oregon. Nobody's ever heard of it. Kaiser, Oregon. So tell me, mom, dad, brothers, like what was it like growing up, mm -hmm. and, and 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 what positioned you to become this guy? So. Yeah, I'm from Kaiser, Oregon. It really all started with my parents, man. My parents were incredible, man. They really fueled my passion mm -hmm. for the game. And it was my dad's – basketball was my dad's passion as well. He didn't play, like, college or pro, but he would just be at every men's league, every run, and uh, he put the basketball in my hands at two years old. Mm. So I would just go to all his games, and I would absorb it. You know, a lot of times when little kids go to their men's league games, their dad or whatever, they're mm -hmm. running around the back in the hallway mm -hmm. or whatever. I was, like, locked in. I watched the whole game front mm. to back. And my dad was my idol, still is, but like, you know, back then, like, I was just wanted to be like him. And then his passion for the game wore off onto me, like, right away, you know, like third grade. I'm saying I want to go to the NBA. Wow. And um, yeah, so I think their support had a lot to do with uh, me evolving into who I am today. But uh, Kaiser's a great upbringing. It's like a suburb town, it's like a place you want to, you know, raise your family. You know, put your kids in schools. Yeah. It's on the outskirts of Salem. Salem's actually the capital of Oregon. Okay. Most people think it's Portland, but yeah. we're an hour south of Portland. We're actually halfway in between Eugene, like where U of O is. Okay. Halfway in in between Eugene, uh, Eugene and Portland. It's just like one of those freeway towns. You see the Kaiser exit. Yeah. <laughs> you never go. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was great. My my parents fueled my dream, and uh, we were like a basketball family. You know mm. what I mean? Like dad's coaching the yeah. AAU teams <laughs> and. They, they gave me the Jordans, and then what really was foundational is they got me a trainer when I was in fourth grade. Okay. Yeah, and uh, shout out to Rodney Howard. That was my trainer, but he taught me some very foundational moves. You know, he taught me, like, the in and out, mm -hmm. in and out crossover, and then he taught me the third movie he taught me was the Iverson crossover. But mm -hmm. I realized, I didn't realize at the time, but now looking back, I had just had a gift. Like, I picked these moves up in a week. Ball handles, Ball you're, you're picking it up super quick. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm picking it up in a week, wow. and I'm able to go shake a full grown adult like Hoopers too. Wow. Fourth grade. <laughs> and I'm and I'm and I've always been tiny. Yeah. I've always been a featherweight. So yeah. like, uh, I think it was by about fifth grade I, I mastered like the Iverson crossover, and I literally would play in like adult pickup games, and like mad people would come watch and get really excited because like I'd do that little hezzy step and then do that crossover, yeah. and people would like 
trip up and I'll make the shot. Wow. <laughs> Fifth grade. Fifth grade. Sheesh. Wow. Yeah, so that, that was really foundational. But then, you know, my parents just put me in the clinics, the camps, yeah. even even all the way up into uh, being encouraging when I got cut. For, uh, back in the day with AAU, sometimes there was only one team per age group for the state. Mm. So I was trying on that one team. And, like, a couple teams I got cut. A couple times I got cut. One time I was, like, an alternate. But my parents, they were always so encouraging. Mm. And so – then all the way into high school, you know, I'm, I'm on JV as a junior. I'm at a big school, a 5A Whoa. school, several thousand kids in the school. I'm, I'm on JV as a junior. And uh, it's because the eye test, man, I always just look like I'm so young. Yeah. You know? Coaches <laughs> didn't trust that I could actually play D at that yeah. level. They yeah. saw the offensive skill, but yep. they might not have trusted it too because I was always like a flashy player. And that, yeah. that didn't really fit the uh, the style of basketball in Oregon. was more Princeton offense, yeah. very like hoosier Yeah, You know, it's a little bit dated now. Yeah. but. Yeah. I didn't fit the mold, and so like they they put me in a Christian school uh, senior year uh -huh. just for a better opportunity. Yeah, and um, that's cool, man. That's cool that they yeah. saw that in you. So in terms of the the foundation, it sounds like yeah. you're at the gate having some street ball influence because it sounds like yeah. the school you're at, the high school you're at, they're playing boring basketball, as we would say. <laughs> right? Yeah, I think I think it was like strategic. I think back in that time. You know, basketball's evolved over time, and I think, you know, a lot of teams that were less athletic than, uh -huh. say, like the inner city schools, yeah. like you would run like more intricate offenses and you try to work together as a team to win instead of like individual skills where the, the kids in the inner city are doing crossovers and alley-oops. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. just a different game, you yeah. know, but now like the way skills have evolved, they realize like everybody can get better and, mm -hmm. you know, move their skill sets up and then there's better ways to play. But I think, not that I think offenses are bad, right? Mm -hmm. you, you need a great offense, yeah. great system, but... Yeah, so that's how it was yeah. really back then. So, so you're you're learning these moves early on. Yes, it's not really working with your high school team. Your parents put you in a Christian school. Yeah, and uh, and how how did you do there? Now you're just going to your senior year, or your junior. Year, they put you in a senior. In yeah, a, in a so <clears throat> it even goes back before that though. I would make mention is I would always play pickup and go crazy, right? Like, but they had. That style of basketball had taught me that pickup was garbage ball. It's the circus, and it doesn't count. Wow. And when you get into the season, this is where the real deal is. Mm. And so, I don't get me wrong, I still go crazy like AAU. And then, mm. like, even on my JV team, I scored, like, 30-plus multiple times. And I'm, like, on the JV team as a yeah. junior. Yeah. Um, but they never would give me, uh, you know, that full trust and opportunity. Um, but... Uh, you mentioned me being a street ball fan. I got into it actually when I was like a freshman in high school. Okay. Yeah, that's when I saw Antoine Mixtape Volume One. Okay. Yeah. So I'm I'm, I'm, cause I'm 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 trying to figure out is this art imitating life or is this life reflected in the art, right? Because yeah, N1 came when we were in high school. We're about the same age. Yeah. I think same year, right? 2003. You graduated? I graduated 02. 02. So you're year yeah. year year graduated before me. But yeah, M1 was just exploding, and yeah. so I, unless you were really hip and culture to like Rucker Park and right, and I had some friends that went there, but we didn't really see that until M1 really exploded. Yeah. Um, so that's what I'm trying to figure out: is like, is this your life, and then it just kind of transcended, or did, did the M1 influence you? This is a good question. So it was all meant to be. Because look at the player that I was most drawn to first, as far as emulating, yeah, outside of Michael Jordan, because that was everybody. What was Allen Iverson? Okay. And so I was drawn to his flair, and I loved how he moved the crowd. Yeah. And then uh, when I – so that was like fifth grade, right? Iverson's in his prime. He just shook Jordan. You yeah. know what I'm saying? I just yeah. bought the shirt, Iverson crossing yeah. Jordan. But – That was a moment. That was a moment. That was a crazy yeah. moment. It was crazy. It was crazy. And, and Jordan's crazy because Jordan – people forget, he almost got a piece of it. He yeah. almost recovered. But anyway, so I'm into that already. I'm into Tim Hardaway. I love his crossover. I'm into Rod Strickland. Rod Strickland was like dope. He's like the Kyrie before Kyrie. Yep. I think he's actually his godfather. But anyway, so I, that's the style of basketball I was drawn to before I even knew about street okay, ball. Okay, got it. So when I saw and one, it was like, yo, this is everything I love, yeah. like on steroids. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. Like the energy of the crowd, the creativity and the moves. Yep. I was already making up moves before that. Like yeah. I just yep. loved moves. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. And so I still had aspirations like, hey, everybody, everybody's a hooper wants to make the NBA. But mm -hmm. then I didn't even realize I'm more into street ball than the NBA or mm -hmm. – Hand in hand, you know mm -hmm. what I mean, and so, yeah, and one brought street ball to the the forefront just globally. Period, mm -hmm. right? You're like West Coast don't really we we have Venice Beach, but that mm -hmm. wasn't even a big thing, right? Mm -hmm. Locally and in L. A. It is, but yeah, I mean, I remember watching like White Man Can't Jump and seeing a glimpse of it back yeah. then, and then just 
going to the park and playing mm -hmm. and there was some element of that but it wasn't as tangible until after i feel like n one really exploded and we knew alan and, and obviously the crossover but it, i feel like when it really exploded was after n one and then everybody 100%. is like you know yeah the the, the, the super baggy shorts yeah right? jordan had the, the the shorts to his knees and everyone was like in a super baggy shorts. yeah i was, was just... bummed if my if my shorts didn't hit my socks <laughs> like if it, if it didn't go down mid shin yeah. Yeah. i was like oh these are square i, I can't rock with these that's why i stopped wearing nike yeah, like, wow. Cause, I, yeah, because their shirts were sh shorts. Yeah, <laughs> and people forget this, right? Nike's so dope and they do everything so well, but yeah. they forget there was a time I actually looked at Nike as frumpy at a point. I was like, oh, they don't know how to do basketball mm -hmm. in these squares. You know what I mean? Yeah. Which is funny because I'm rocking Jordans. But, like, literally I was all in one. I got yeah. rid of all my Nike shoes, all the clothes, everything, and I was just in one only for, like, all the way up until I made the team. That's so. That's, a, that, dude, that's a, such a trip, man. <laughs> I know. My senior year in high school, I'm wearing the Tai Chi's. Wow. The ha you know, the ones Vince wore yep. and dunk on us, but yep. I had the gray ones, the half yep. gray, half white. And then every high school clip I got, I had ones. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so I'm, I'm asking these questions because I'm also I'm also interested in, in what greatness looks like. Okay. Right? I love the book Outliers. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you've ever read that. Master. Heard of it. Yeah. Need to. I mean it's a, it's a lot of it's a lot of overlap into what you into your life and a lot of folks who exceed at an elite level. Mastery by Robert Greene. Robert Greene wrote The 48 Laws of Power, and then he wrote a book called Mastery okay. Okay. later on in the process. Right. And so this, this intersection of the right environment with the right support system, right? It's huge. The right family. The family that's just even attentive to like, hey, you're, you know, you're not working here. We're going to put you in this school. We're going to get you a coach in fourth grade. I just, you'll meet my son later, but he, you know, we're, we're going um, basketball clinic twice a week. He's in second grade. And, uh, and, and we go training with a strength trainer once a week, mm. every week, you know? And so it's, it's this environment of positioning someone to optimize on what they can become, even if maybe, uh, you know, in, in your case and in my case, like genetics may not be in the favor, right. that everything else was, was positioned for you, just a, a stable family, loving family that's attentive, that passion basketball. Um, I think it's so brilliant because you are a, a basketball legend in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm always curious, like, what was the fer what was the ground? How was the ground? The fertility of the ground, the 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 environment that the sowed that the seed was sowed. And so it's interesting that you know your parents are very attentive, and then you're going through high school, but you don't really get it laid out for you in high school. You're playing varsity your junior year, which was. And high school was not lit. JV, yeah. JV, excuse me. Yep. JV, your your your, uh, your My junior junior year. year said that backwards. And so it's 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 fascinating to see that. And then you're 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 chipping away without a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. No one's mm -hmm. noticing like that, right? At all. And the team that's inspiring you, you then get to go and try out for. And so what led up to that? Because you that wasn't they didn't come to your town, right? Didn't they go to like Portland and you have to like figure out how to get there? Mm -hmm. How did tell, tell me that some of that story? So I think it really starts back to that senior year when I went to that school. Mm -hmm. For the first time, a coach at a varsity level, you know, which was, you know, the high level at that point <clears throat> for me, you know, like the varsity coaches were like always, you know, mm -hmm. the deciders, right? So he had full confidence in me, but he was a he was a college ball player, so he could see talent. Mm -hmm. And like I had crazy like offensive skill talent. I just know, I know uh people weren't encouraging it and they didn't trust it, right? Like the white kid at the suburb school doing the Iverson crossover feels untrustworthy because like the coaches don't even teach that. Mm. And then it's like, we don't really know what to do with that. We don't do that. You know what I mean? We we teach in triple threat, drab step. Mm -hmm. So it was like too uh it looked at as too flashy. Mm. You know, so um so it goes back. They put confidence in me. The, the two coaches there, this dude, uh, Colby Molin, and shout out uh, Tim Olson. I was just talking to him yesterday. He was super cool. But uh, they put a lot of confidence in me. I mean, to the point where I even gave my assistant coach an Anwin mixtape. I gave him volume one, and I put him on to it. And he's, wow. like, he's like, yo, that dude was good, man. It's Ray for Austin. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, skip, man. He's like the GOAT. And so um, we had a great camaraderie. And then I, you know, I scored 30 plus a bunch that year. And I was one vote away from MVP, and I got like second team all state. Mm -hmm. So it started there. It started to feel really good. And like I said, I was I was always good, but I was always just show glimpses of mm -hmm. good. You know, you, I mean? you would have these bursts. Yeah, of like like oh, go he scored over thirty. Yeah, but then you're not averaging over thirty. No, every game. no, I was always average, like between ten and twenty. Yeah. And, like I was always pretty good, but yeah. like just not given that slot. Right now, are colleges starting to look at you? Is there no. some options? Anything? No. So here's what happened. So after high school, I had that good season and went crazy. And I don't know how it works. I don't know levels, right? Sure. Two A school at that point. There's uh -huh. only three hundred kids in the whole school. Uh huh. 
So no colleges even take a glance uh -huh, okay. over there. Okay. Um, so no college offers. I went and uh, went to open gym with three JUCOs or mm -hmm. community colleges. Mm -hmm. And it's funny. I actually went crazy at all three of them. Mm -hmm. Like I remember one of them. I don't even know. I missed the jumper. Like it was. I was like, for sure, I'm gonna play there. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then they always they 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 got to back to my dad a couple days later. Like, hey man, we don't think he can play defense at this level. You know, he's got some good skill. You know, wow. tell him to tell him to keep working. Was that true? Was um, your was your D sloppy back there? Then? Were, there were yeah, there was element of truth to it. That's why like a lot of people are like, man, you're probably bossing up on those coaches that didn't give you a chance. And I'm like. I don't even view things like that, yeah. right? I'm, I'm, more, I'm more of a gratitude mindset, right, right. A, but then B, you know, you look 11 years old and you shy away from physicality. Are we supposed to put you as a starter? You right. know what I mean? So there was a degree of, I think if I was encouraged and maybe mentored by somebody who already like walked that path, then I could have been a, a better off. But yeah, I think I think I was a risk, you know, to a certain degree. So then I ended up playing community college ball, but it was only because my dad, who owned a jewelry store, he sold some jewelry to the local community college, the mm -hmm. one I didn't want to go to because I wanted to get out of my parents' house, go like move to a dorm yep. somewhere. Yep. So I didn't even want to go to that one, but I ended up getting a spot there because he persuaded the coach that like I had a passion for the game. He's like, God, look, my son, he's really good. He, you know, my dad was like that dad. The coach yeah. was probably like rolling his eyes, but he was cool enough to actually give me a shot. Yeah. So he saw that I had talent though, because I went up there and I went crazy a couple of open gyms. Mm -hmm. He probably said the same thing about the defense. So he allowed me to redshirt. Mm. Then a couple guys got injured. Mm. So I get thrown in the I, I dress down. So I ended up mm -hmm. playing my freshman year, but I only played like three minutes a game. And if the game was close, I don't even get in. There might have been one or two games I put like 10 minutes or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And so that was my freshman year. And I was always like, I was real deer in the headlights. But I think when I look back, it was because like those other coaches didn't incur they they hyped up, they hyped up varsity like it was like the league. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm looking at it too big. You know what I mean? Yeah. If I would have had some more perspective, like JUCO, like like you gotta be good to play college ball. It's like JUCO, that's bottom barrel. Like, yeah. It's not that crazy. You know what yeah. I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. If I had that perspective, it would have helped. Yeah, so. that's that's interesting because it, it was it, it was hyped up, wasn't it? In high school, like varsity was a big deal. Yeah, parents are all green too, right? Nobody right. knows the, nobody knows the system or level, so they all think like their son playing varsity is going D one next. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> it's like you'd it's be a ways to go, bud. You're lucky to get on a college <laughs> roster, exactly. Right. But you know, my dad. To be fair, my dad was always like pretty realistic with it, and uh, always an encourager. Both my parents were great. So. Yeah. So you play freshman year of college. Yeah. You play a little bit, barely. Yeah. Barely. And then is that when the N1 tour is coming around mm -hmm. to your area? Yeah. So this is what happened. This is what I like to tell people. So I had been getting better even though I'm only playing three minutes a game because I was playing next to guys that were awesome. Like I had a, a roommate, this guy, Greg O'Neill, man. He was an awesome guy. He, he ended up playing D2. I had another couple guys on the team that were going to go D1. Mm -hmm. We had like a seven-footer. You know what I'm saying? So I'm playing a high a high level athletically. Yeah. So it's changing my game even as I'm – you know, take going through the learning phase. After the season ended, those open gyms in the summer, uh, I ended up being like the best player. I improved like 300%. Mm. And this is because I was doing 5 a.m. workouts, like make make 1,000 jumpers or mm -hmm. make 500 jumpers before class even starts, mm. which that's a lot, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. After class, uh, we got open gym. Then we hit the weights. and then I'm And then I'm working out on my own somewhere else that night. So I'm doing like three a days with weights. Whew. And I'm playing – high level, and then they're bringing in recruits. Yeah. And then, like, recruits are coming in, I'm wiping them down yeah. to the point where these D1 schools are coming to look at other players, and then now they're like, who's this kid? Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Because I was running the court every open gym, just, just whole court the whole time. Yeah. So I improved, like, 300%, and I didn't even, I'm not even knowing. Yeah, like, I'm yeah. so green, I'm just I'm not even know how good I actually got. Yep. So then, of course, I'm a fan of N1. I went up there the year before. And I actually like made it out of the trial. I got to play against the N one team a couple games. Okay, shout out to um, my OG Sick with it. I played against Sick with it, and uh, I didn't do much. I only scored like a bucket or two, but I got like one move off. Mm -hmm. It was all actually ended up on N one mixtape volume six. People don't know I'm on six, and not, not seven, which was my debut. Whoa, yeah, okay. So, so uh, so N one comes along. Yeah, I drive up there. My Nissan, my '94 Nissan Sentra. Me and my brother, we were just excited to go check out our idols and, like, hopefully catch a dope game. And, of course, I'm going to play. But, like, if I wouldn't have made it in there, I can't say I would have been bummed because I was just excited to be there just yep. to watch as a fan. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, getting in there, I don't even know if I felt like I earned that. So, mm. next thing I know, I suit up, shake a couple dudes up. People are going crazy. Mm. You know what I mean? They're like, And then it's, like, me and this other dunker dude that were, like, the finalists go in the building. 
Next thing I know, I'm playing where the Blazers play, and I'm going back and forth with this battle with hot sauce. And like, <laughs> he like made me slide. Yeah. I like touch earth. <laughs> I scored like a few points, but they, they liked the battle and the fact I wasn't scared. Yeah. 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 Man, okay. So that's that's interesting because in the Netflix documentary, they made it look like yeah. you kind of just came out of nowhere. Yeah, I think I think that uh I think what I learned, especially going through that doc, was yeah. A lot of those timelines were a little bit off. The story doesn't get fully told, so it gets told in a way that's not fully accurate. Like they said, uh, I got cut from a bunch of teams and then got opportunity. And it's like, well, I know where they got that because during my interview, I told them how I got cut from the uh, BCI, which was AAU back then, and there was one all-star team per age group. Yeah. So I got cut from that, but then I got held back on the junior. So, yeah, I did get cut from varsity and cut from there, but it's not like I still wasn't like playing, so yeah. it sounds a little bit different. Yeah. Um, and I did come, I mean, to and one, I did come out of nowhere. I mean, Oregon, they didn't expect the, the contestant to be from Oregon. Well, the fact that you were on the previous mixtape. Okay, yes. So <laughs> Hot Sauce and Sigwood, they like remember me. Yeah. They remember me because um, I think I had a sort of a distinct look, but they they remember me. The other guys didn't. But uh, yeah, so a little bit of familiarity, a yeah. little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So. M1 comes around, you're on it. it I, I want to, you made the, the, the Netflix documentary. It was really dope. It was really, it was really I thought they did a great job of storytelling. Yeah. yeah. I had a critical, I was a little more, okay. Like, my feedback a little more critical just because I lived it. But how, like, honestly. How, how long did it take to shoot your parts? Is that like a long, exhaustive process? Or was that pretty like, sit down for one interview and they got everything they needed from you? That's it. That's four, it. Four or five hours in uh, 2020 before COVID. So, oh, so that interview was four or five hours worth of content? Yeah. Condensed to like... Condensed to... Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's a trip, man. So, okay. So tell me, which parts did you think were kind of inaccurate or not the most cleanest timeline? Um. Yeah. So like when they showed like the Nike commercial, Nike Freestyle, they mm -hmm. made it sound like it was after the ESPN show actually started, but it was before I even got on there. And that had nothing to do... That didn't tamper with Anwan's business one bit. Mm. Like Nike commercial was dope. The Freestyle. I, like, I loved it. Mm -hmm. Jay Will was on there. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to Jay Will. Just shout out to Jay uh, But, like, it didn't tamper with the business. They made it sound like it, like, weighed in on Anwan and took away from or whatever. But it was, like, one commercial and done. It wasn't a lifestyle. Like, mm. Anwan people are lifestyling. Like Anwan street ball. So everybody. you're saying this is, this came after the ESPN reality show? No, the commercial, they, they framed it like it did. Uh -huh. But I think it's in storytelling. You got to figure out how to tell your stories because if you make a sure. big deal about something at a certain point, it might not feel right. It's about flow, too. Right, right, right. So uh, that happened before I was even on and one. Oh, okay. Yeah, the Nike freestyle. And uh -huh. then. So did Vince Carter dunk all that happened before you were on and one? I think that was 03. That was 03. Wow, okay. Yeah. And then, um, so same year, around yeah. the same time. No. That was, that was before. It was before. Yeah, it was 02 or 01, I think. Wow. But but also... Um, so you're saying that was inc inconsequential to N1 having any kind of blip in their business model. Was the Vince Carter wearing the, the N1s when he did that dunk and then Nike signing him and doing this kind of street ball commercial. You're saying it, it wasn't as big of a deal as they made it seem in the doc. N1 was going crazy until those owners sold the company. So that was, that was one of my uh, critiques of it, mm -hmm. which... To me, I think the dog was dope, though. Like, a story told really dope. But I think there was a couple things that could have added value. Like, uh, yeah, so so the company went down. They made it sound like we fought a lot, and then, like, Envy got in the way, mm -hmm. and then a downfall. But it's like, no, it's like when they when the owner sold the company, split 100 mil a few different ways, or however much it was, that's when it started going downhill. Because it got in the hands of people who didn't know anything about basketball, much mm. less street ball. Mm -hmm. you know? And then they brought in some guys to run the brand from like, they, they were at like uh, Adidas and Reebok. But they were like OGs. They weren't really into street ball. They were more like NBA guys. Like one dude, you know, he, he was a good businessman though. He like made a, made a shoe for Kobe, made a shoe for Shaq. Mm -hmm. So he was more into that NBA circle. The mm -hmm. street ball was like too off to the side for them. So they weren't into it. So they tried to make Anwan like this well-rounded machine, but it just wasn't ready for that. Got it. And they didn't have the dollars to do that. You got to pay an NBA player multi-million dollar deal, a top tier guy. Yeah. So they didn't have the money at that time and it was just different. So that's when it went downhill. But I think also some of my uh, critique was they didn't have our best highlights. You know, like <laughs> you're talking about why N1 was so big and yeah. the effect that the splash it had in a culture, but it didn't show those, like a lot, of, like for example, not even just biasly, it didn't show my best highlights, but also like hot sauce, right? They talk about how he changed the game, which he literally changed basketball. Mm -hmm. And he said, he in the doc, he said he's one of the most, he was the most basketball, popular basketball player on earth at one point. Mm -hmm. I think if he's not accurate, he was top five. Mm -hmm. 
and they changed the game. But they didn't show like there's moments where he shakes somebody up, they fall, and then everybody runs on the court. It didn't show a lot of those mm. moments. It kept showing him like just a blip of a trick move. Mm. And then like even for me, it showed like one of my best career highlights. But that was it. It showed like kind of like random um, clips, which it didn't like completely devalue the dog, but would have added some value, I think. I think it would have added value to kind of better highlight where everyone's at now. Exactly. And you could have built it. You show show why hot sauce is like a handle god. You know what I'm saying? Show why I got to where I'm at, you know, and then it, it would encapsulate the energy of the moment a little bit more. Yeah. That's, that's how I feel like. But who knows? Did they have rights to all the footage? You know, was the guy who was pulling clips, was he a fan of it back then? I think all those things weigh yeah. in, right? You never know. But the dude who directed it, it was he was dope. And uh, overall, it was, it, was, it was pretty dope. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so a few things about the documentary. So they they make it seem like there's a lot of drama, there's a lot of issues, and they also kind of posi- <laughs> this is because it sound weird, but they also kind of positioned you like you were hot because you were a white guy, mm-hmm. like well, professor, you know he like it, it had this weird aura around mm. like you were popular because that, and I was like, I don't know how much of that was accurate in hindsight. Like you were really shaking people up, you know what I mean? Like back, at least from when I was in high school, and I remember. I I didn't see it as oh this guy is getting a pass because he's a white dude you know what I mean like did you kind of gather some of that from the doc and was there some of that energy on the ground? Well, I knew all the guys so well that are giving the sound bites. Like even my homie G Lock, he was a he was a cameraman. He was on there giving an interview, and he I think he's the one who said he said when a white guy can do something in the hood yep. and do it well. Yep, he said it, it amplifies that much. But then he goes on. He said, "But Professor was like the real deal." He was so the real I, deal. Yeah. So I think it was both. Mm. I think it was both, and I didn't even know at the time. I'm just having a great time. Yep. You know what was going on as a kid. You know, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think it was both. I mean, obviously being white helped it. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It, it like amped it up, yeah. of course. But I think what they were speaking to is, was I better than sick with it mm-hmm. or AO or what? no? You know what I mean? Like no, no. I happen to have an incredible summer that I couldn't duplicate, mm-hmm. <laughs> and it, and it, in you know, it made a dent in the culture. It was really impactful for me, but those guys are better players. So I think when they say it, they say, no, dude, dude, dude was good. But, you know, being white boosted it. Yeah. Like some people might have thought I was the best player on that one. Yeah. You you could have you could have sure, got that narrative sure, too. Sure, sure. Right. Some people I remember seeing a picture. This is when it really bugged me out. There was a picture of people's favorite players, and there was like a voting poll on a website, mm-hmm. and it had Michael Jordan, Vince Carter. Jason Williams and myself on there. It's like, wow. who, who's your favorite player? Really? Yeah. And then, like, I wasn't even last. I don't know who was last. I wasn't even last on there. Obviously, MJ's up there. But I was just the fact that that graphic even yeah. existed. Yes. The fact that even a kid could have made that or yes. whoever. Yes. To me, I was like hyped that even somebody would have made that. Yeah. In terms of the structuring of the N1 situations, towards the end of the documentary, they go, Yeah, how do we have them signed up as sponsored athletes and not as employees. We no, he was saying, get... had we treat as employees instead of endorsers. Okay, endorses. so it was the opposite. Okay. Yeah, and that was unrealistic, though, because, like, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Yeah. You're not going to do an employee situation. And plus, he was saying it like we could have gave these guys stock options as employees. But my thing was, like, you can do that in an endorsement deal, too. And, and it was That's like, what I thought. I thought they were saying the opposite. I thought they were saying you guys were employees, no. and had they given you deals of athletes, they could have given you stock no, options. The truth is, it's not big money. Like it was an endorsement deal for less than hundred k, at least for the first guy's first few years. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? By the time we ended, I was making some good money, and I know some guys did at a certain point, but yeah. So I, I that that was an interesting take. But yeah. I don't know. I mean, do those guys feel that bad about the situation? They're not trying to call and mend things up. They ain't got no money for nobody today, so I, I don't know if they feel that bad. You know, I tweeted that the other day. Like, yeah. I said, hey, the and one owners, because I don't feel like I'm owed. Yeah. I came on right before the peak, yep. and then it went crazy, and that got bought out like two years later. And then started... You did two seasons with them? I did six. Wait, 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 wait. You came on before? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I came I'm sorry. on 03. 03. And, I, and it ended 08 was the last year. Got it. So you did six seasons. Six seasons. And you said initially it didn't pay great, but towards the end it started paying really well. Yeah. yeah. And it was great. It was all great for me. Yeah. I'm 18. Yeah. I thought like a couple hundred dollars was big. So. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, my first deal I think was like 70 or 80K for the year or something like yeah. that. I'm, I'm thinking I'm rich. About yeah. three PS, you know, PS2s. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on a video game. You know what I mean? Like. I wasn't tripping at all. So I don't feel like I was owed. I branded after things happened, but I feel like I feel like it's not as hot and cold. Like the players might say, hey, we're owed millions. The owners obviously said it wasn't worth paying anything. Mm. I feel like maybe somewhere in the middle would have been the most moral and just thing. But I mean, you know how it goes, like million dollar bios. Nobody's like, How can I be courteous with this? Nobody <laughs> unless you're yeah. a believer, maybe. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I I don't know that. 
Yeah, man, that, 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 that's an interesting tension between like what would have been the generous thing to do versus what was legally agreed upon in the agreements, you know, and, and the ethics of it. it it's it, confusing it's, territory. It's confusing, I feel man. like they could have been nice to give everybody a hundred, couple hundred K. Yeah. Because the thing about it, if they sold, I can't remember what the exact amount was, somewhere 130 mil. Maybe I'm off. It was, it was north of 100 mil. Yeah, north, if it's north of 100 million between four dudes or three dudes, which is funny. I only met one of the guys. I don't even know those other dudes, mm -hmm. the owners. What's, what's giving everybody 200K? And I'm just talking about the original seven or eight dudes. Yeah. I'm not talking about, because by the time they sold it, we had like 17 guys in our contract or something mm, like that. Okay. So that was my thought. Yeah. yeah. But you also said you don't, you don't feel like you don't feel any type of way about it. I was blessed to be a part of it. That's yeah. how I feel. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like I was blessed to like play with such great talent. One of my OGs, shout out to Headache, he was in an interview recently and he said that I am really like a professor. He said, I studied all the and one players and I got a little bit of everybody in my game. And it's so true. Yeah. It's so true. You know what I mean? Like Headache said that. The irony is like, I just want to all like repost on like World Star and other yeah. sites for doing like one of Headache's moves. And then like I do Ali Mo's moves. Obviously, I had a lot of influence from Hot Sauce. Yep. AO. So I feel like I was honored to play for them. And then, you know, when it ended, I'm only 23. Mm. I was only 23 when it ended. Mm. So like I had a lot of career left and it just made me that much better. Mm -hmm. And I was able to. To me, not branding never made any sense. Like, of course we're going to brand. Like, if Anwen ain't going to do it, I got to do it. Yep. I, I didn't even reach the peak of my game or career or anything. So yeah. that's how I viewed it. Yeah. In the documentary, <laughs> you don't have to talk about this if you don't want to. I'll talk about anything. It's all good. But they made it definitely seem like there was some debauchery going on on these tours. And they said you had a gang of groupies. Here oh, you yeah, are, was... small guy, you know, <laughs> from a small town. It, you know, going to a Christian school, you know. Uh, yeah, but well, I wasn't Christian. But you weren't yeah. Christian, but yeah. you know. So, uh, how uh, how much did you wild out? How much did you indulge and in, in really? Because I mean, they made it sound wild. The stuff they were saying in terms we, of what we, was we were wild. We were wild. We had I had multiple girlfriends every city, uh, globally. Every, multiple girlfriends Mul every city. Every city globally. What are you, are Andrew Tate? <laughs> but, but to be honest, we that's just the honest take of anybody yeah. who's like rock. If you're not like not in the faith, or you yeah. even if you hey, you never know. You yeah. know what I mean? That yeah. money and fame is yeah. different, right? Yeah. You because my I only know that in my adult life. I you know as far as like having the fame or whatever. So you see your girl like there's like a high percentage chance she'll hang. You know mm. what I mean? Or do whatever. So yeah, we had like multiple girlfriends. Every city, everywhere. I remember we do the Australian tour three times. I had like three girlfriends every city in Australia too. Whoa. I, to the point where it's like, what was that girl's name? Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She'll hang. Wow. Whatever. You know what I mean? So, so this is over six years. Yeah. And not everybody. I can't say everybody on the team. Yeah. Some dudes are married. Some guys didn't. Yeah. You know, not not everybody, but majority. Yeah. yeah. Did that impact you a lot as, as as a young man? For sure. And the access to excess? Oh, for sure, man. Like when people say that, that's a new word, right? In this this generation, the access to excess. But mm -hmm. I know that verbatim and it's so true, man. And uh a lot of learn a lot of learning experiences, you know, and then um I was influenced by the lifestyle and uh Yeah. What what was there some 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 deprogramming that had to happen of course yeah talk about that for sure you mean talking about after coming to faith yeah. sure yeah oh yeah for sure i mean it didn't happen until then <laughs> you know? yeah so but so up until you come to faith you're kind of you know you're the you're the rock, you're the rock star basketball legend actually okay sorry let me rewind that so our last endorsement deal expired at the end of 08 okay and that was the last run on espn was 08 i mean maybe in that last season mm -hmm. We used to spend 20 plus times a week on ESPN, like, or more, like 20 to 50. I mean, I'm telling you, it was the filler show. When there's not a show, you just throw street ball on, right? Mm. It's like poker, street ball, and one of the, I don't know what else, yep. basketball games. Yep. Sports Center. Mm -hmm. That's right, Sports Center. So, uh, the last one in 08, I remember it aired, like, you know, this week, this episode, boom, it went through the season, mm. then it re ran once, and that was it. Mm. And then it just completely ended. We didn't really get a call. I was like lightweight in touch with the company. I think they offered me a sneaker deal like 2009 for like a couple thousand dollars. I actually turned it down because it didn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I did like one-off games everywhere, mm -hmm. but I wasn't even known. In the U.S., I walk around, I wouldn't even get known. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was going from like full-time security everywhere I went to – I remember I went to an actual college game. Usually if I go to a basketball, it's the most crazy, right? People but I go to yeah. – it was either a high school or a college game, mm -hmm. and, I, and only one person came up to me, and they go, hey, aren't you 
did you play on some like a uh, basketball tournament thing or something? <laughs> you look kind of familiar. And this is only one year removed. This yeah, is like 2009, wow. 2010. Before social media, ah. you get forgotten quick. Yeah. And even now, it's like if you don't upload, right? You for, like, it's crazy. So yeah. fame is like super f- unbelievably fleeting. And that's the most high then with before social. So, wow. so because yeah, because you're like mainstream famous. Like you are doing, you're on ESPN. ESPN is a big deal. We didn't even know, you know, we actually didn't know how mainstream famous it. We knew it was big. We knew it was like global, yeah. but we didn't put ourselves in the same level as like mainstream. But like, we're not realizing like we get way more spin than like an actor on a hit TV show. Mm-hmm. We get way more spin. Yeah. So we didn't know how to measure that. Even today, right? Some people don't know how to measure like A, B list, yeah. you know, A list yeah. influencer. How's yep. that weigh in? Yep. 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 Unless yep. you're in it. Yep. And so we didn't know. Um, but yeah, so I went broke, lost all the fame. I'm selling my own jerseys on eBay. I kept about like 75 of my and one jerseys. Mm-hmm. I sold them on eBay to survive at one point. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You got back. How did you go broke? Uh, I don't remember this about check, your story. Check to check. But but you were, yeah. I mean, if you were making six figures for eight multi-six seasons, figures. Yeah. multi-six figures for eight, so let's just average it out and just say, uh, you did a mill. Yeah. But so you made a few mil. So the lifestyle mm-hmm. creep must have been crazy. Oh, yeah. yeah. Why would we save any money, man? We got to ball out, you know? <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. Here I am thinking like, oh man, like guys were responsible and saving and no, okay. No. So, so the lifestyle creep. I can't speak for them. I yeah. know, I know at least good half of the guys shared with me. Yeah, they went broke too, you know, at that time. But like, I don't know for everybody. But wow. yeah, so so you go broke by just kind of just spending frivolously, living yeah a, a pretty lavish lifestyle, and then the money just cuts off. Yeah, yeah. Well, and honestly, I I wasn't even a, like a big. I didn't like buy a boat and multiple house. I wasn't like that. I was like, it was a lot of little things added up. This is a good lesson for people financially. Just because you don't buy like expensive jewelry and a house or try to buy like a crazy car, that doesn't mean you still can't go broke. Mm. If you spend every time you go to the mall Mm. and you pay for all the meals for the homies. And then like I did, like I had a Benz that like I paid like, I was trying to pay it off fast by three grand a month on the Benz just Mm -hmm. to like get it paid off real quick. I don't know why that was relayed to me as good advice. And then I had, I did have jewelry. I had like an iced out, like, Basketball earrings, four thousand dollars, custom made. And what was the biggest expense? What was the, what was the single biggest expense? The single biggest expense, uh, rent. Oh, sorry, rent in Oregon and rent in LA. You had two spots. Two spots. Uh, crazy bins. Um, what was the biggest expense? There was like some jewel, some big jewelry things, but it was a lot of little things added up, and then. Mm. Every time, I'm like a kid in a candy store because I was so young. Like I said, people don't even know. And when ended, I was 23, 24. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So uh, every time I go to Fry's or Best Buy, we, we got to just buy a bunch of stuff because like we can, right? It's fun. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you want some? You want a PS? You want a PS2 also? Whoa. All right, get you. Your friend want one? All right, let's get it. Wow. <laughs> I'm just, I, I was always nice like that. I was like, wanted to live it up at the home. You know what I mean? So wow. I'm like, cool. like okay. But it always just added up. It didn't feel like anything at the yeah. time, right? Yeah. That expenditure is not a big deal. But, wow. you know, and then I remember one time my uh, financial advisor at the time, she was like, hey, did you know you're spending more than you're making like every month? And I was like, oh, for real? You know, and she sent me like a statement. It was like a spreadsheet. And I'm like, it's too hard to read. I don't know what this is. So, so she tried to warn you. She warned me, and I, ta- I tailored back a little bit, but not enough. Yeah. I'm supposed to, like, do a life reconstruct, you know, financial reconstruct. Yeah. I didn't, you know. You didn't think to, back then, I guess, like, buy a home, pay it off, so at least you had your residence covered? Tried to. Okay. Tried to. Uh, in Oregon, I was going to, like, I was, like, leasing a convo, and the, and the dude said, like, hey, lease it for a year, and then I'll sell it to you. And then, like, he backed on his word. It's like a house on a lake. And mm-hmm. then after I, I moved to L.A. for some acting stuff, I had, like, a lead role in a movie Moved to L.A., and then I was like, oh, this is a spot. But I didn't really necessarily have the money or it might have been hard to get a loan at that time to uh, get, like, a, you know, multi-million dollar or a million dollar house. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah, and yeah. I'm guessing you're young, probably don't got a ton of credit at the time. Yeah, either. and to be honest, I could have bought a house, though. To be honest, I, I just house. didn't stop and, like, hey, let's think finance. Like, yeah. it was a fast life, yeah. you know? Travel, and one tour in eight months out of the year. Yeah. Tied up in all the girlfriends. Yeah. You know, was there per diems on those tours? Like, are you getting your salary and are you getting, like, daily Crazy per diem. Like, what was the per diem a day? Good like, question, but I feel like at the end of the week, I had at least a few racks of few per racks. diem. Wow. And, like, you know, you don't yeah. even... They so give you, you way more than enough, right? So you're living high, but you're overspending. Yeah. You go broke. Mm-hmm. And how did you... Tell me, like, when did you realize, like, oh, I'm broke, broke? Probably about, like, 2009, uh, the recession hit. Okay. And I remember what savings I did have. I almost had six-figure savings. I had to take that out. And I was like, no big, you know, almost 100K in there, whatever. So took that out. 
I go, that went quick too. Mm. You know, then, then, then I'm starting to feel the months, right? Every month, I look back at that account where I never checked the account before because I was mm. like, oh, it's all good. You know what I mean? We're getting 50K check here, 40K check here, 20K check here, 100 and some K check here if we got a big deal. Mm. So I don't even think about it. I'm like, oh, right. but uh, yeah. So then I started to feel it about 2009. And I think it was about late 2009 or 2010. I think I only had, I had like less than $200 in my account at one point. Wow. Yeah. Because I think I got a whole bunch of tickets or like some tax stuff caught up to me, and then boom, it was like super low. Tax them taxes, bro. Them taxes, man. You know, you keep up. So with they it. got you with the taxes. Yeah. And, and then, you look uh, into your account. And, and I was always legal. I always paid my taxes. I had like, I always had like good accounts or like I had like good teams, even though I was being a knucklehead. Yeah. Uh. So yeah, then it just deflated. I had less than two hundred dollars in my account. I had all these bills, and then. I did notice on eBay because people would tell me like, "Yo, your jersey's selling for thirty five hundred and this and that." So I I, I kept seventy five my Anwin jerseys because we had sometimes we wear that same jersey two or three times. So the ones that are going crazy, I got a copy, mm. and I was like, "I don't value it that much. I keep three of these." You know what I'm saying? So so I sold them all. You and sold all your jerseys. Sold them all. Made like thirty k or something like that. Thirty to fifty k, and I lived off that for like eight months, six months, okay. and I was still a knucklehead. I was still, like, eating crab and lobster, like, off the jerseys. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know, you don't know any better. You're still yeah. trying to live the lifestyle. Yep. You know, and appease the people and be cool. So, uh, and I was getting into acting, so even though, like, I was broke, I was still trying to merge into acting. I had, like, a lead role in a movie. Yep. I was hoping that was going to come you out. You were thinking another big payday is coming, probably. I did. I actually was thinking I could parlay into acting because I had, like, a lead role and yeah. it had, like, an A-list cast. I had, like, Nick Cannon, Ludacris, all mm -hmm. these actors were in it, and then it never came out. Oh. I got shelved, and then, like, I got representation, and they shelved me because they had big wigs. Like, they're getting me because they're like, oh, the guy started on ESPN in six years, but it's always about what you're doing now. You yeah. know, it comes to representation in Hollywood. Yep. It's like, what are you doing now? What about mm -hmm. this month? What about this week? What'd you upload? What'd you, what'd you do? You know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, like, I was that guy that was, like, two years ago, mm -hmm. and everybody kind of knew it, but they wouldn't tell me. So I'm on the roster with other movie stars or A-list, so they're, like, barely even talking to me. And I didn't know I'm supposed to leave and go get somebody else, but like mm. you don't know the game. I was like, I got a top agent. Let's go. So wow. So you figure out you're broke. You sell all your jerseys, and then how did you start to turn it around? Yeah. So and, then, and, and when did faith play into it? Was faith was the catalyst for faith you? Faith was around? the turning point. Okay. But so tell me about that. I still hustle. I was always a grinder, no matter what. You yeah. know what I mean? I was always a hustler. And I always was into branding and entertainment just by default. I, I always think back now, like, why was I drawn? And I just felt like it made sense because we had that TV show. So it, for me, it always made sense. And when I noticed YouTube, people in other countries were running up to me and saying, oh, professor, you know, mm. and I'd be like, oh, man, thanks for watching the show. And they'd be like, no, I saw you on YouTube. Mm. So I'm like, YouTube. So I started research, researching that, 06, 07. I had a homie who's an editor making edits just to flood YouTube, not on his channel, mm. not even on mine because AdSense didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And literally, professor mixes that were fan made. Mm -hmm. People record the show, make mm -hmm. the highlights. Mm -hmm. Those are getting like three million per. Mm. So I was like, might as well make my own. Mm. Let's let's go crazy. Let's flood YouTube. And so I was always on that wave. So I was doing one off games overseas. And one was still in like all over the world. It was in forty countries. Mm -hmm. And at that point, before digital, we were all separated. You don't know worldwide media back then. Mm -hmm. So like. And one Africa thinks that and one USA is still crazy hot because mm -hmm. all they got is the mixtapes. You still watch media that's a year old and not even know how old it is. Uh huh. So it was still hot. So I'm still playing. I'm being a rock star in these foreign countries, but then coming home and it's not. It's not the yeah. same. Were you getting paid decent to do that? A few grand. A few grand. A few grand. I mean, so not the same. It but it, but it was so few and far in between. I didn't make much per year. Yeah. So that didn't start to pick up until about 2010. But okay. I'm still broke. I'm still yeah. like compared to like my name and like sure. what you think it should be. And sure. I'm just getting by. I ain't saving no money. Yeah. So then when 2011 hit. We had just signed contracts to do this other tour that was supposed to be like the next upcoming annual. It's called Ball Up. Okay. And uh, Escalade was on there with me, one of my closest friends and teammates. And he ended up dying. Mm. So that shook my world up, right? Because I never even had a relative die up until that point. Mm -hmm. I'm not even a grandparent or anything. Yeah. <clears throat> so that, that really shook me up. And then I was already kind of like down just from the whole, everything wasn't really going good. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And I was just kind of uncomfortable. So. I went to his funeral. Mm. Mark Jackson is his brother, mm -hmm. Escalade's brother. A lot of people don't know that. Mark Jackson, the analyst, ex-NBA mm -hmm. player. Mm -hmm. So he was doing the eulogy and went through it. He's talking about Christ, and I'm just, like, remembering things I heard of as a youth, like, at that Christian school. Wow. And then uh, preschool. I went to Christian preschool randomly, too. Yeah. My parents always thought those were good schools to be in. You know what I mean? My, my mom was, like, raised Christian, too. So um, anyway, during the eulogy, he did an altar call. 
And I just felt compelled, like it was the, just the right thing to do. Mm. I can't even say I knew. It was just it was just God's plan, you know. I, mean, I went up there and did it. But then I like after that, really was looking into the faith heavy, like on a much deeper level. I already was going to church out of courtesy. I was playing in a church league, and the dude was inviting me to church. This mm. this guy who's kind of like my mentor today. Mm -hmm. So I already God was already planting those seeds, and mm -hmm. then the altar call. I went forward, gave my life to Christ, and then I was like locked in, looking into, it, and I really had a transformation through that. Wow. Yeah. So mine wasn't always like, you know, some people sometimes like I was counting the cost of like what it was when I give my life to Christ, but I didn't fully know. Mm. And then like as I looked in, it was just, it's crazy. The transformation had happened. And this is about 10 years ago? 2011. 20. Okay. So yeah, third, third, 12 years, 11 years ago. Yeah. Sorry, my math is bad. <laughs> math uh, is crazy. Man. So, so 11 years ago. So tell me this. Did, did, uh, did you go through like uh like was it like instant where you're like wait a minute I'm I, I've been irresponsible financially I've been kind of living reckless in, the, in these other areas and you just kind of did a complete 180 or was it more gradual Yeah um it was both I'd stopped going out I okay. didn't I didn't go no clubs Okay that probably saved a lot of money I left behind all my friends Okay everybody was kind of like a party or athlete or yeah. whatever something in entertainment Yeah I moved to the valley, like West Valley, which mm -hmm. a lot of people in inner LA, they'd be like, you live out there? Like, that's like past Woodland Hills. Mm -hmm. Like, you almost Calabasas, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and that was before Calabasas was even popular. But um, yeah, so new friends, uh, all believers, start going to this church in the valley. Um, complete uh, different views on everything immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm in the word daily. Mm. Uh, I was in a study, watching stuff online. Um, I, I always call it, I was like all spiritual steroids. We're like, like almost unhealthy. We're spending yeah. <laughs> big amounts of the day, but it was great. Yeah. You know what I mean, it was probably great. what you needed. No, it was what I needed. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. It was actually amazing. And then, um, did you ever go through the cage stage? I didn't even know the words transformation. I didn't even know the word. I didn't even know what that was until a year in. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I had a transformation for sure. And then everybody identified me as that. They yeah. like, oh, he's, you know, People out of the faith, they'd be like, oh, he's real religious. You know, yeah. go to the club. Yeah. Whatever, so, did you ever go through the cage stage? The cage, the cage stage. Yeah, I think so. Where I think that's what where, that where was. We just got to put you in a cage because if you if you say too much, he gonna hurt everybody oh, around you. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think a lot of people do, right? Well, yeah, well, a lot of people do. What was that like? Hundred percent trying to convert everybody you yep. meet. Yep, yep, yeah, yep. trying to do it in twenty minutes. Yep. Um, Take them through Romans Road, try to close them on a prayer like a used yeah. car salesman. <laughs> yeah, but, I, but I, think, I think God was strategic to take me away from a lot of, I just didn't even have hardly any friends except yeah. for my people at the church who I was getting to know, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And then um, definitely a full transformation then. And then, um, yeah, it was a turning point because now everything I do is for the people. I do it to inspire and impact people, yeah. you know? And like a lot of times that's a faith thing, you yep. know? Like yep. I'm trying to do more uh ministry events for free just go do mm -hmm. them you know what i mean just yeah. serve like today that's what i'm going to or whatever but um but yeah so i've been able to impact that way and then also like i like even being a christian i don't think it's bad to inspire somebody to hey i want to get back and play ball or yeah. you know some people tell me like you inspired me to pick up a basketball again i'm 45 i just like to go play yeah. and have fun that's or beautiful. even non-ball players are like man i'm inspired to do whatever my craft or whatever yeah. i do yeah your videos inspired me to do that or yeah. even like a lot of time people be on their bed a deathbed for cancer and they tell me all, like i've gotten tons of those throughout my career wow. man i had cancer i was down i was watching your vids man it brought a smile on my face tear to my eye mm. so i was like wow you know what i mean you can impact people in a lot of ways but i'm trying to make a more intentional effort especially nowadays getting older to do more like just direct on ministry stuff when i can yeah, yeah. that's dope man and so so th there's a transformation that happens mm -hmm. about 11 years ago you're in church now you yeah. kind of cut off a lot of the the friends that you would party with and then is this around the time you started doing your own YouTube? Yeah. Okay. And yeah. The, and was the Spider-Man thing the first thing that really popped off there? Yeah, so I started the channel 09. Okay. And you were just doing highlights at that point. Old school throwback just highlights. Just highlights only. Okay. I found a kid who made some of the professor mixes and went crazy. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, you could send a DM on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So I DM'd him. We got in touch. Turns out he lived just south of San Diego. He's in Chula Vista. Mm -hmm. So that's like, you know, a few hours from L.A. Yeah. Yep. I was always a grinder, though. So I, I asked him if he could teach me how to edit and if he could make my first couple videos on my channel. And so I drove to his house three times a week. Mm -hmm. Like, it's kind of crazy. It shows I had nothing else going on. Three times a week, I drove from L.A. to his place. From the valley? From No, from West L.A. From West L.A., 
to Chula Bro, I don't even go to Chula Vista. To Chula Vista. Chula Vista is practically Mexico. It's crazy. It's crazy. So I'm going <laughs> so, down hold on, there. You're going down there and he's editing and you're like curious. It, and I watched him edit the videos. And you want to wanna learn to edit the videos. Yeah. So he told Okay. Me. So hold on. There's a lot there. I didn't know that. There's a lot there as a creator yeah, that you're willing to, 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 I mean, you're practically skill stacking. You're taking something in, in a discipline that requires to be great at basketball. And you're saying, I'm, I'm in my mid-20s now, but I'm going to be curious enough yeah. to go and learn. From a kid. From a kid. 16. The craft of video editing. Yeah. I never knew this. Yeah, the kid was awesome though. This man. is this is but this is big for for people who are just I just want to do one thing. I want to stay in my lane. Da, da, da. And you're like, nah, dude. Like I'm gonna grind and figure it yeah. out. So you're going down there. Yeah. And 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 to be fair, when those people ran up to me and said they saw my YouTube in in London and in Australia, yeah. it really occurred to me like, hey, this is a TV channel. This mm -hmm. is free distribution mm -hmm. globally. Yeah. And I know at that time it was only in ten countries or something. Mm -hmm. Now it's like everywhere. But I did think. This could be TV later. Yeah. Like, if everybody can have their own TV channel, what's that going to mean in 10 years? I was wow. like, let's, let's go crazy. It's my only chance. Yeah. And nobody else care about me. Wow. Agents won't even give me a gig. Right. And they rep me. So, so yeah. So, I learned from this kid. And uh, he made my first, like, few videos, two or three videos on Professor Live. And then I did it. So, I had, in 2013, uh, I had one video that had over half a million. And a couple of those were 100 and some K. And then other, like, a bad video would do, like, 10 or 15. Wow. Okay. And so I was like doing pretty good. I remember I had 17,000 subs. But uh -huh. that's like uploading just whenever I get some footage. Like yeah. I ain't even filming it firsthand. Yeah. Just whenever I got the footage, everywhere I go, I tell you, hey, can I get the video? Yeah. And I chop that up or whatever crappy quality it was or whatever. Yeah. Um, so then my homie Rob, shout out to uh, my homie Rob Set Free. I think he knows you actually. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he was the one who told me, uh, taught me how to use a DSLR. And he was like, hey, man, have you ever thought about trying to go viral? Like, Mm -hmm. He was like, there's some real promise here. Like, you could strategically try to go viral. So we brainstorm, put our heads together, and then he comes up with the idea for Spider-Man basketball because mm -hmm. he's like, look, it's cosplay, which mm -hmm. I didn't know nothing about. It's prank. It's, it's, it's comedy. It's sports. Mm -hmm. It's basketball. It's, it's all in one. Yeah. It's like six genres in one. Yeah. And uh, I go out there and did it, and then I came back that night. I shot it in 20 minutes, bro. Mm -hmm. Never missed a shot. Held the court, just yeah. played like king of the court with some people. They probably yeah. thought I was on drugs. And then uh, every trick worked. Yeah. Couldn't even see the hoop, and I'm throwing it, keeps swishing. I was like, all right, whatever, I'll take it. Wow. Yeah. If you notice, I didn't shoot a three because when I had a three point, I couldn't see the rim. Yeah. So I went back and edited. It took me like three and a half hours, four hours to edit it. Uh, I didn't know how to compress a video, so I'm only exporting master files. I think that was the, <laughs> that was the only, only option back then. They didn't have that 4K for Apple device. Yeah, yeah. They didn't yeah. have that in Final yeah. Cut. So it's like Final Cut Pro 7. It's probably taking forever to upload. Forever. So, so I said like 15 <laughs> hours. So I, I edited. I went to sleep that night. I had a flight to Chicago. Yeah. 7 a.m. I had a game. Yeah. In Chicago. We were touring with ball up. So I wake up next day and uh, still uploading five more hours or whatever. So or, or maybe just said like an hour or something. So I was like, screw it. I was leaving the computer on all weekend. I was like, I don't care. So by the time I got to LAX... It had already uploaded. I got like the email. They used to only have the email notifications. Mm -hmm. And I remember I looked at it and it said it had 310K views. And I like double take. I remember I was tired. I'm half asleep. I'm rolling to the terminal. And I like looked at it like, wow, is wow. that right? And I clicked. I was like, is that right? It can't be right. Yeah. Then the time I get to Chicago, already has over a million views. And then by the, oh. yeah, then like day later, three. And then by the end of the week, six. Holy moly. And back in the day, remember that time, you had six million in a week. That's a real viral video. Oh, yeah. That's like, now the algorithms are better, right? YouTube's yeah. way better than the algorithm. You yeah. have a banger, banger. You might, like one of my videos did 16 in a week. Yeah. So it was different, but it, my inbox on YouTube is spam. Good Morning America, ESPN, MSNBC, uh, CNN. Wow. Sports Center. This is 2014? 13. 13. So 2013. So that's kind of how that went down with Spider-Man basketball. But shout out to my homie Rob. He really came up with the idea and then like. Yeah. Shout out to Rob, man. Yeah, Rob. You know Rob Monroe? Is it set free? I'm really familiar. Set free. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know the handle. Yeah. So that's crazy. So is how big was the channel? Because you said you had 17,000 subs. How big did the channel grow at that point? Oh, a million overnight. Overnight? Well, in a week. In a week. It, it literally, like, I think, actually, you know what? I, that's the way I say it. I think it was like eight, seven, eight hundred K, and then the next few months got to a million. But basically, was the AdSense the business bo overnight? Booming back then? I made. 
So I was in a bad MCN deal, 50-50 uh, split. Uh, yeah. Somebody told me that was a good deal because Vivo channels take 90, artists get 10. It's like, this is a good one. It's like, okay, that doesn't mean it's good for everybody. Yeah. But I went for it. So I was in a three-year deal, uh. 50%. So I made, end of that month with that viral, first viral video, I only made $4,000. Mm. So it totaled, my t channel made over 8000 at that time. Yeah. yeah, 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 which, I mean, a lot has changed. In terms a lot of has changed. YouTube stuff. yeah. yeah. And so uh, it took you a while to kind of reveal that you were the Spider-Man character, right? Like you kind of kept it on the low. Never format. took off the mask until like way late. Yeah, like yeah. way late. But it was better because it was more pranky. Yeah. And then it brought some like mystery, talk about it more. Yeah. Um, I think if I would have took it off the first, it would have just been kind of over at that. Yeah. Or who knows? It wouldn't have been as cool. Wouldn't have been as cool, I yeah. felt like. How did you get to this modern format you're at now where you got you go to the, the yeah. these these dope locations just play some pickleball, guys talking trash. You know what I mean? Like, how did you get to this place? By accident. I okay. think God guided it. But honestly, like, so, yeah, God brought the the Spider-Man thing work. Cosplay goes off. But then also, this one time in uh, 2015 or 2016, I was playing a dude, and he was, like, a little bit heavy, mm -hmm. and he had, like, a button-up on. So one of the narratives early on social, and I used to pay too much attention to comments mm -hmm. or what people say. One of the things is like, he don't play any good competition. He's playing bums all the time. And so, <laughs> Which is funny because it's like, no, 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 you're not playing good competition. It's like the good competition looks like bums when you're playing against yeah, an elite level two, athlete. Right? It has yeah. to be one of the two. <laughs> right. He looks so bad. Like either he was good, just looked bad or whatever. But I mean, the truth is I just play everybody. Right? Yeah, you go yeah. play street ball. I'm the best yeah. in the street. What am I supposed to If I played college player, I'd be a college player. Play right. in the NBA, I'd be a right. NBA. You know what I mean? Right. So... Street ball, that's what it is. But, uh, yeah, so I played this dude. This video is my biggest video on YouTube today. Yeah. It has 82 it's million. He dislocated his shoulder, right? Yes. Yeah. It's like, it is fake. We couldn't have wrote a better script. He talked all this crap. Yep. It's like a movie you helped laid out. And the the location is nuts. It's yeah, like Laguna Courts yeah. on Main Beach. Yep. It's one of my favorite courts in the world, if yeah. not my favorite. But, yeah, and then somehow a one on one conversation comes. He, he wanted to play. It's like his idea, talking all this crap. He's like, just watch his hips, man. It's easy to guard him. Boo, boo, boo. So we ended up playing one on one. Midway through, I shook him. He slapped the ground like he went hard. I didn't even touch. You know, sometimes ankle breakers are contact. Yeah. This one's a no contact ankle yeah. breaker. Then two plays later, I did something. He, he threw his shoulder. I like broke his shoulder. Then we had to stop the game. And I was like, "Hey, good game." You know what I'm saying? And then uh, that one did like over ten in a week or something like that. And then uh, he tried, he threatened to sue you or something, didn't he? They sent me. Uh, I think they allegedly sent me some papers or something yeah. like that, but. Whatever. I mean, it's his idea. YouTube ruled my favor. They filed a privacy complaint. Hold on. He filed a... <laughs> That's privacy. whack, bro. It was his idea. Yeah. Yeah, and then they counted, but YouTube counted. You know what I'm saying? There was like 47 cameras yeah. filming it. Yeah. So, I mean, there's not much of an argument there. But I feel like we couldn't have wrote a better script. Like, yeah. it was just insane. But when I go to the edit, check this out. Yeah. I go to the edit. I don't know why. Whenever I went berserk viral, I always edit till 5 a.m. It's uh -huh. like a trend for me. Yeah. So... I'm staying up late. I'm editing the vid. I started early, but it just went on. I got in the zone. Yeah. And then I decided to edit this one. Let's tell a story of why I played this dude. Let's show how this game comes about mm -hmm. because I always play these people. I just show the highlight mix, and then y'all got a problem with who I played. Mm -hmm. So I showed why. I showed the trash talk. I said, let's subtitle it. You can't hear him fully clearly. Let's subtitle it. Mm -hmm. Let's tell this whole story mm -hmm. of how we got there and why we got in the game, how it went. Let's keep the score. Boom, 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 boom. And then I was like, it's perfect thumbnail, man. This this ankle breaker, mm -hmm. it's crazy. I said, mm -hmm. let's just do that as the thumbnail. So I did everything right on accident. Mm -hmm. And then it was the first ever video that said expose and trash talk. Mm -hmm. My cousin on the dude, he was like, you about to get exposed, <laughs> he told the dude. Mm -hmm. And then my title, I was like, what do I call this dude? Heckler? I was like, people don't know. Not all people know what a heckler is. Mm -hmm. Is it trash? I'm not going to say ish talker. Mm -hmm. Like it's He's a trash talker. Yeah. So I was like, all right, 1v1 versus trash talker for $100. Laguna Paradise Court. Yeah. <laughs> that was the title. And then from that, everything's trash talk, right? Yeah. I see people in different genres versus the trash yeah. or whatever. So we did everything right, but I think God is kind of like guiding yeah, it. And man. then we learned, you know, a story is what's most captivating. I, 100%. If I would have asked somebody experience in film, they could have told me that or, yeah. or, or even YouTube at that time. Yeah. But a story is what brigades are. We're so, I'm so hooper, so athlete. Right. I'm only thinking basketball and the amazement of the game and it's like bro it's more to life people are more into life and stories than they are your skills so something that can lead to the game is yeah. like what well, goes crazy and then if you cosplay and give it a whole theme that's a different video but yep. that one's awesome too yep in a different way yeah yeah so this video goes crazy tons of views yeah and it, it's interesting because it sounds like 
you kind of got a whole nother career. Like you did the M1 thing and that was a season. And now there's another season and, and it's going, your YouTube is taking off, right? And, you, and, it's, yeah. and it blows up. It's crazy. And so you're now at almost 7 million subscribers. Hopefully by the time yeah. this is this this is live, you'll be north of 7 million. Yeah, praise which, God, man. Which is Hopefully. amazing. Oh, really? <laughs> um, get that 10 million, that plaque. Let's go. The, the, what is it? The, is it the diamond plaque? Is that what they do at 10 million? I can't remember what. I yeah. think so. Yeah, I think it's at that. Um, yeah. Lord willing, man. Lord so, I, man, there's so, there's so many really cool elements about your story. Like you being willing to reinvent yourself, the faith component to it all the uh, ability to get into the minutia of the details mm -hmm. and to learn to edit and learn to make thumbnails and mm -hmm. all of these different things. That's why I was like, impressed by your grind, though, because you knew a lot of things, like, early. Yeah. Like, I'm doing YouTube for four years, like, just n not even know what I'm doing, like, yeah. doing some numbers, like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. But if you think about it, it's all transferable, isn't it? Like, streetball has an artistic flair to it. Yeah. It's not just, no, let I me get the the best back, the best bucket most efficiently on you. No, no, no. I'm going to do it with some flair. I'm going to do it with some style, you know? And then I'm going to uh, maybe talk a little bit. <laughs> I, I actually learned I'm a creative. Yes. I learned I'm very artistic yes. and very creative, and I learned that... As this thing goes, I'm I'm equally an entertainer, an, an entertainer, as much as a hooper, if not more. Yeah. Because I joke my cousin, like I don't even practice. You know yeah. I mean? Like I, I do, but like it's hard to find the time. We got right. All this going, we producing right. these vids, we yeah. trying to storyboard, we doing every platform, yeah. and I still edit thirty percent of my videos because I can't find nobody that's, better. Dude, that's incredible. <laughs> that's incredible because 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 the logic would go outsource, outsource, out, outsource. You focus on the business. Don't be so wrapped up in the business. But as a creator, you know, I've tried you want to be hands on. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I tried to completely outsource yep. a bunch of times. But then as soon as I go back and touch it, it goes berserk. And then the brand changes. Now we go to the mall and yep. everybody's like, yo, I just seen him. Yeah. It's like yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. And then now the media wants to do interviews. Yeah. So it's like, I realize I can't get off fully. But shout out to my cousin, Zach. Shout out to Zach. Yeah. Zach's the homie. And shout out to my homie, Jay Lyons. Yeah. They're fire. Yeah. Like, like they, they're... Jay's better than I am. Yeah. Zach might be better than I am now, too. Yeah. Uh, but it's hard because if you have the vision, yeah. you want to fulfill the vision. So it's feel like I should stick with that edit. If I have a vision and Jay shoots it, it kind of has to turn into his vision a little bit, but it would be excellent. Are you did you train them up? No, no, no. Jay, Jay been in a What about Zach though? Yeah, I train yeah, Zach. You train Zach. Train Zach. I mean, but that's that's ultimate yep. leadership right there. You re Praise you God. recreated yourself yeah. to someone that is potentially better than you now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and he's and he's a grinder. Like I edit off inspiration. I have to be all juiced up and inspired. Yeah. He's just a grinder. You yeah. need it done by this date. He's gonna get it done. It's gonna be excellent. Yeah. So and then Jay Jay's been in the business as a director. He's mainly like director, writer, producer. Yep. He can edit if he wants to. Like yeah. he just he's just a beast. He did a prison video I went to. Okay. I think that has like over fifty million views. Crazy. Today. Video. It did six. That's that the one video. did sixteen million a week. And he's a believer too. So he brought me to that ministry, that prison fellowship. Yeah. But anyway, those. So, so the whole squad is is most of the guys around you is, are you know that are working with you are the Christian guys. Yeah, 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 about about eighty percent of the staff. Yeah. yeah. Do they? Do you see this as more than just entertainment? Like, do you? I mean, obviously, you know it's more than entertainment, but the, the, like, it sounds like you guys are also all aligned that that inspiration that you give to people can 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 be a form of ministry. A hundred percent, hundred percent. You know, and then the fruit that comes from it, everybody being on the same page, man, it's hard to beat. You know yeah, what I mean? Because yep. a, you got that trust, right? We all have the same moral scale. We have Christ moral mm -hmm. scale. And then also just the power behind it, bro. I'm telling you, like we some of these vids be supernatural, bro. Mm -hmm. Like even the prison. Mm -hmm. I go to prison, you know, I'm a little weary. I don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. A bunch of convicts. I was like, mm -hmm. hopefully they like my story. Mm -hmm. And if we hoop, I'll just go, you know, whatever. Yeah. But I didn't miss a shot. That, I mean, I barely missed a shot that day. Yeah. Every move worked. Yeah. Just like the Laguna, it's like fake. It's like a story. Yeah. And then people actually comment all the time, be like, yo, this is fake. Yeah. And I was like, hey, I can't blame you. I see why you think that. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> At this level, you're way more gracious with the comments. You're not taking anything personally. No. <laughs> you know those like, moods you clap back, but I haven't done that in a while. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because then it's like the professor responded to me. Yeah, yeah. now it's a bigger deal. But like, uh, but no, I mean, yeah, dude, it's, I honestly feel like God has his hand in it the whole. Yeah. Like, in a more direct, incredible way. Like, I really don't put God in a box. You yeah. know what I mean? Yep. Like, my favorite verse is like the... Jesus looked at him and said, with man, it's impossible. Yep. With God, all things are possible. I really try to live that way, yeah. and I look at it with all things, right? Yeah. People think Bible, and they think God, and they think there's a posture, and yeah. it's all in the church, or like it's a certain way. But yeah. I'll be like, no, nah, he'll he going to make your video go yeah. crazy. Yeah. 
and it's going to be it some, somehow everything. glorifies. Yeah. It, it works yeah. for your purposes exuded in that. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And then the platform could, ex- if he wants to expand, it's like because of that. Yeah. Even though a lot of hustles involved, you got to meet him halfway. But yeah. so that's how I look at it. Yeah. Tell me about Global Hooper, man. L- last time I was, we we were hanging out. We set up your podcast spot in the old spot in the old yeah. warehouse. It seems like you guys have only glowed up, leveled up since then. The brand is going crazy. Tell me about crazy Global guy, Hooper. Yeah. Um, Global Hooper, man. I started uh in 2017 it's funny because i was actually global hooper on instagram i tried to rebrand fully like mm-hmm. i wasn't even the professor i was like oh that's and when everything's this old school Let's, i'm the global hooper now mm-hmm. and then i went everybody was connecting the dots and they were saying professor it just made sense so mm-hmm. i switched my ig back to the professor okay. but i love this name this global hooper and so because it kind of brings it's like unity too right and uh so then i, I call my brand global hooper and uh People took to it decently, especially like the people who were already super supporters took to it and really support it. But then like when I started getting like three, four million subs, I noticed a big boost. And, like mm. people were like, it's really important to people and they can't wait for the next drop. Mm-hmm. And now we got headquarters downtown LA. Come we're, on. Like, we're like three blocks from Crypto Arena. Come on. But it's actually, I made it our headquarters and offices, but it's also a content studio for other creators to come in there. Oh, that's dope. They can see Global Hooper, but they also have a space so I can give back. I was the first b-ball youtube hooper or yeah. influ- basketball influencer yeah. period on accident uh. so now it's like my way to give back to all the up and coming because now it's a community yeah man it's yeah. crazy and it's a big deal like like the <laughs> online uh, i see a lot of the instagram stuff um i see a lot of the the younger guys coming up and obviously yeah. some of them are influenced and it's 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 it, like l1 was a big deal but now there's so many different pockets and so many different people and like you said earlier the distribution changed yeah, distribution changed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And algorithms changed, right? Yeah, YouTube's algorithm right now are way better at it. Yep. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been great. But with Global Hooper attached to the brand, it's been awesome. And uh, looking to expand. You know, my goal for it would, would for it to be a culture brand mm-hmm. at some point. I know um, with clothing, man, it just takes funds. You know yeah. what I mean? It, it takes, takes a lot of funds. So we can do that slow growth where we reinvest, yeah. or maybe it's an investment situation at some yeah. point. I haven't figured that out, but just taking it one step at a time. Yeah. You, I'm sure you'll get to 10 million subs Lower sooner wind. than later. Glo- global, global Hooper is blowing up. Could you ever see yourself, if you had the option, to buy N1? You know what's so crazy? My security guard who uh-huh. drove us here, yeah. he asked me the same question on the way here. Yeah. And somebody asked me it like three or four days ago. Yeah. So it's funny you even asked that. Here's the thing. I actually talked to a group of investors that tried to buy it though yeah. less than a year ago, and they they turned it down. They offered them 150 mil. So it's a huge it's a huge thing. Um, I don't think I would because I feel like, and I don't like I don't like I don't ever like to speak down of Van One, but I feel like it's viewed as a legacy old school thing. Uh-huh. And I'm always about being more forward movement mm. and new. You know what I mean? So I don't know acquiring it. I don't know what that does. It gives you distribution at Walmart. It, mm-hmm. d- it depends though, because you know. Walmart has the relationship with them now. So mm-hmm. it's like, are they going to want it with a different person? Mm-hmm. What does that look like? Yeah. So, hey, if I had 150 I, million. Yeah. I would assume <laughs> if they're in Walmart, their their distribution and supply chain is probably rock solid. Smashing. That you can then scale and work in other things. One of the, That actually came up when Kanye was complaining about Yeezy, uh, Gap, and uh, Adidas. People, He was like, I want to take over a brand, big brand. Cause they, right? And somebody was like, you should, you should get N1. Oh really? Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Which which would be crazy if that. Yeah, and who knows? Nothing's impossible, right? Some people have the opinion that it's old legacy, and some people have the opinion that I need to bring an one back. I mean, I've heard that my whole career. Bring an one back, you know. And it's like there's so many challenges with that that they might not know. You know, number one, you know, I can't brigade it. And one has to brigade it. Number two. The talent level is different, man. Them dudes mm-hmm. on the and one team, not only were they all pro-level ball players, we play seamlessly with NBA players, mm-hmm. but they also had crazy flair and crazy personalities. Mm-hmm. And it all just it just happened. Yeah. Like it wasn't even, you know what I mean? Yeah. So today, you'd have to like rock with hoopers who were already like on. Yeah. It's hard to do new talent because they have to be good at social now, right? Yes. So the dudes are already on at social. Don't yeah. get me wrong, all the YouTubers are dope. Yeah. And they do great and they're very entertaining. But majority of them, I'm not saying all of them, some might be pro-level hoopers, but most of them are college-level hoopers. Uh-huh. And there's levels in basketball. You know what I mean? If you're a college-level hooper, you're not going to do what we did. We went we went to Japan, play like a D1 or D2 pro team, and wax them and put on a crazy show. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that now it's shifted and now these guys on, on YouTube are building their own audiences, making their own money? Like, that's kind of crazy. More. You'd have to pay more. Think yeah. about it back then, them deals they got us for. Yeah. 
What would you have to pay a prominent YouTuber to be a part of your traveling tour to take away time from there doing lot. their social? Yeah, yeah, it'd have to be a lot bigger, a bigger investment. And yeah. you need, we can't just say we're starting our own YouTube for the new tour or it's, it's going to be all me, mine. Right. It's got to be like a Netflix. It's right. got to be a big distribution thing. Just mm. like back in the day, big distribution made it a bigger deal. Yep. You know, whether it was the mixtapes or whether it was ESPN. So I like the idea of doing something different. I am going to try to do a world tour next year. Come on. And I'm trying to do some like, I can't tell you how many people were like, when's your doc coming? Yeah. Or when are you going to do a streaming series? Yeah. They've been saying streaming series for like five years. Yeah. So I'm going to make my most serious push starting planning into this year and hopefully next year. But it's not easy. Yeah. So I'm going to try it. But I like not being measured to N1. I, yes. want, I don't want to go under N1 umbrella. Right. I want to go under something new because you're still going to have those people who's measuring to N1, the OGs. Yeah. But like to the new kids, I like it to be something brand new. Yeah. I think, I think having you on, this is my second time having, this is obviously a longer conversation, hearing you on Adam22. Um, I think oh, yeah. I think you should do a podcast. I think you should do a podcast know, and sit that. down and go this deep because I think sometimes when you do stuff at a dope level, you're numb to the to the minutia and the details. It's easy to do. And it's just like, oh, this is just my story. But there's so much here that I could go deeper with you on about just your ability to reinvent yourself, your ability to learn new skills, which a lot of people are afraid to do. Like and all of that overflowing from the hustle of being a baller and the discipline it requires and the restraint. So I think there's so much value you have to offer, I think, other creators and other folks that are trying to figure out how to go from being an athlete to a creator to an entertain, right? That that I, I think it would be dope for you to sit down and have these sorts of conversations with the next generation okay. of ballers. Like I sent you that kid Gio who's been blowing up. Oh, I love Gio. Cool kid, man. <laughs> it's so funny too. Yeah, man. Funny, yeah. entertaining. Yeah. You know, has the handles. Yeah. We got up. Uh, you know we got up. No. Yeah, we did a collab. What? Yeah, I, I How didn't did I miss this. I wasn't shooting. Uh -huh. I met him on a random day when I was hanging out at the shoe surgeon's okay. uh, spot in okay. downtown. You yeah. a shoe surgeon? I, it sounds familiar. He's dope. He got a, he got industrial space, like okay. the top shoe customizer. Uh -huh. Anyway, we just met it's, uh, one of the homies. Shout out to Kenny Dobbs. He yeah. just brought him through. They were hanging. He's like, can I do? A, I was like, yeah, we'll do something. So I just showed him a move. I think they used it for their platforms. Oh, that's dope. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying. Like, I think you sitting down with these kids. I know. It would be. You know what it'd be like. And as you gonna think this is a crazy parallel. What? It would be the way Tyson sits down with the Sick. next generation. I like that. Cause because you there's enough age gap there yeah. and there's enough wisdom on your part where you can ask these questions and go deep mm. and impart game, you know, but also just kind of probe and just ex extract value as well. One thousand percent. And I like that, you know, part of me getting the new space, but a podcast was in mind. Yeah. Uh what I'm just trying to figure out now is how to make time. Yeah. So I think come back to time, right? Yeah. It's doable though for yeah. sure. Yeah. It's doable. Well brother, I, like I appreciate it. you making Thank the you. time, man. This was incredible. Um, it was. Thank you. Thank you. Like, for real, thank you. I, I, I can't say that enough, man, because, one, you making the time to come. Two, you just, you just, dude, you're generous. I don't know if people understand how generous you are with your time. And praise God. What's Relationships. Right? You've connected me with folks to help me on TikTok. You know what I mean? So, oh, yeah. thank you, brother. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, man. Opportunity to share. All right, guys. Go go subscribe. Let's get the professor to uh, 10 million. Hey. 10 million. We need the diamond play button. Okay? 10 million. We're going to hold YouTube to sending it too. Not going to do no funky stuff. Brother, thank hey, you so much, hey, man. Lord willing. Appreciate you, man. Thank you so much, man. Super appreciate you. All right, man. That's it.